Welcome to American Colonial Reactions to Imperial Tax Policies. This is Melinda Cole Klein. After the win against the French in the Seven Years' War, British colonists had a reason to be optimistic about their future. With a 150-year history of self-regulation and management, they had no reason to believe this would change after the war. But with the new British government in power under the youthful King George III, new policies and trade regulations imposed on the colonies began to inspire a segment of colonial society to speak out or to resort to violence to protect what they believed to be their rights as Englishmen. The year 1763 was a turning point in the political and social relations between the 13 British colonies in North America, not counting British Canada or the British Sugar Islands in the West Indies, and the mother country. The North American colonists, themselves Englishmen, looked forward to increased economic development and a continuation of the practice of self-government to which they had become accustomed. The French threat to colonial expansion of the 13 colonies into the Ohio River Valley had been eliminated after the British success in winning the Seven Years' War. The colonial outlook in 1763, as mentioned, was optimistic. Twelve years later, from elite colonists to artisan and tradesmen, such as Ben Franklin and his peers, and also his readers, were thinking of themselves as American rather than Englishmen. Why was this? With the controversy over direct taxation, instituted for the first time in history of the English colonies, thousands of colonists reacted by resisting the government regulations and legislation. All the while, colonists in Canada and the West Indies did not rebel. Though they were not happy about it, colonists did pay the taxes. And they did not join in with the eventual talk of revolution by 1776. From the 1690s, philosophical and scientific treatises impacted a generation of colonials and British-born residents across the economic spectrum. Why was this enlightened king-to-state relationship being modified from rulers claiming absolute rule over their subjects in some countries in the 18th century. Well, political and social philosophies from the Middle Ages, such as the influence of humanism, were taken up by influential writers such as John Locke. Locke's political line of argument supported Parliament's replacement of Charles II, a known Catholic, in favor of Protestant royals William and Mary. This historical event is remembered as the Glorious Revolution in 1688-89 because King Charles had broken his contract as a ruler showing himself to be unfit for rulership he was replaced by fit rulership in his stead. In the post-war years of the 1760s the government was overburdened financially Parliament decided that the cost of paying for the Seven Years' War did not have to fall exclusively on the British taxpayers who resided in the British Isles, and then the colonists would have to contribute to paying down the war debt. The problem was the British colonials in America were long accustomed to legislating and taxing themselves. In addition, any taxes that were deemed national taxes were paid by colonials at only a 25% value of the same tax paid in the British Isles. 
The war was financed by hefty loans from British and Dutch bankers. Because of this strategy, the national debt almost doubled from 75 million pounds in 1754 to 133 million pounds in 1763. Long story short, Americans have been long accustomed to not paying taxes, resented direct taxation in particular, and if they felt their leader was behaving like a tyrant, they claimed they had the right to rebel against such a leader. King George III and his government believed, after winning the war, identified the self-regulating colonists as a bit too independent, and this situation required correction. They were his subjects, and the colonies were subject to imperial rule. This did not go over well with the colonial residents from New England seaport towns south and west into the humid plantation economies to small farmers and traders living and working in Indian country as far west as the frontier settlements. The British American 13 colonies reacted to the most, in particular with the ones I'm going to mention here. First would be the Stamp Act of 1765. Next would be the Townshead Acts, 1767. They had become so unpopular and hurt business with the colonies. Colonists boycotted British goods. Parliament repealed the Townshead Acts, 1770, except for the one on tea, which was imported to the colonies. This tax was designed to enhance the monopoly of the tea trade by the British East India Company, in which tea surpluses would be sold in the colonies at cheaper prices. The tax was tiny. It only came out to paying a three-penny tax per pound on tea. But radical colonials advocated it was a sign of oppression. In Massachusetts, public mob violence resulted in the destruction of about $700,000 of three shiploads of cargo of tea. This was remembered as the Boston Tea Party. And lastly, I'd like you to remember the Intolerable Acts of 1774. By 1763, King George III, was he really an unfeeling tyrant? Perhaps. Was it out of line that the 13 colonies had the right to rebel against such an unfair government? Perhaps. A line of argument written in the Declaration of Independence stated, among other issues, the king was a tyrant. The direct taxes imposed by Parliament did bypass the traditional approval process that was the custom in the British colonies regarding tax details. A vote taken, yay or nay, would decide on these details of the tax in which colonists could decide on how much and who would pay. Regarding the underlying factors of the American Revolution, or remembered in Britain as the War for Independence, I would like you to pay attention not only to the new British government policies such as direct taxation, but also important are the colonial debates surrounding the rights of Englishmen as colonists believe these rights were disregarded by a distant, unfeeling government, while the members of Parliament and King George III were in desperate straits to pay down the national debt. And because of the disparity between the two perspectives of this situation, eventually violence would break out. Historians have observed and have commented from time to time that the 13 mainland British colonies had in essence created a nation within the British Empire. This, of course, is subject to interpretation. The decision to establish a large standing army within the colonies was one of the first changes in British policy 
following the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War. Before the war, there had been no more than 3,200 regular British soldiers in all of North America. The colonies had relied on their own militias to provide defense against Indian attack and for frontier duty when necessary. After the war, however, Parliament approved without opposition to increase the size of the British Army in the colonies to 10,000 troops. It was not clear what the intentions were of this new military force across the colonies. British colonists resented their presence, quartered among them, and felt uncertain that life as they had known it would continue. All the while, colonists had actively profited from not paying trade duties. Now, with the military requiring by force colonists to pay their taxes owed, they began to argue tyranny and bankruptcy. Meanwhile, the issue of direct taxation inflamed elites as they argued no taxation without representation. In regards to colonial Minutemen, these were militia members, a constabulary force of arms, vowed to be ready for battle in a minute's notice. As early as 1645, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, young men were given permission to serve their towns if needed as a security measure. Minutemen were usually drawn from the families of original settlers or those of long-standing community commitment to their town. Often relatives fought together if the call came. In brief, Minutemen were young, chosen for their enthusiasm, reliability, and strength. They were the first armed force to arrive when conflict arose. Colonial militias were a miniature version of the local forces of arms under the English muster law. The Minutemen as a militia force were created because the colonists had a constant threat of attack and to defend their people they had to develop a fast response force. As a core feature of this presentation I would like you to take a moment and become familiar with these six British imperial policies. First was the Proclamation Act, which limited frontier expansion. It limited conflicts between the Native Americans and the settlers. That was its intention. But its effect affected frontier trade. Next was the Sugar Act of 1764. This was intended to bring the end to smuggling, especially for sugar planters and their ship captains. It empowered the British Navy to search vessels and authenticate cargo. What was the reaction? It angered sugar planters and ship captains who historically had avoided paying the correct duty fees. Next would be the Currency Act. And this piece of legislation actually, well, it was intended with uh, good authority uh, to implement the sterling pound as currency. Unfortunately, there was a shortage of British money in the colonies, and this created upsets and economic woes for the colonists themselves. Then there was the Stamp Act of 1765, which in history books has seen much in the way of press time. This was a tax on all official and legal documents, also including newspapers and playing cards, to mention only a few. This angered colonial elites. Patrick Henry electrified colonists with his Virginia Resolves, which were published in newspapers across the colonies. British merchants in Britain eventually pressured the government to nullify the law, and this would bring an end to it by 1766. And then in 1767, there were the Townshead Acts. This was a grouping of taxes 
uh, to that were going to be implemented against the importation of lead, paper, glass, and tea. These were popular imports. A trade boycott headed by John Hancock was pursued from 1768. And this created wide support against boycotting British goods imported to the colonies. In 1770, this Townshead Acts would be amended, and the only one left would be the tax on tea. Lastly, I'd like you to remember the Intolerable Acts of 1774. So after the Boston Tea Party, this piece of legislation imposed martial law, closed the harbor until the colonists had paid back the money owed for the tea that was damaged, and expanded the Quartering Act. Colonists viewed these imperial policies as an arbitrary violation of their rights as Englishmen. By April of 1775, we're going to have Lexington and Concord, which is going to bring armed conflict and revolt between colonists and British troops. American colonists were aware of their own growth and profits earned the previous half century. This level of success, shown in a measure of wealth, supported the belief they possessed the ability to manage their own affairs, even in time of war. All the while, colonial exports had quadrupled during the same time period and the five-fold increase in colonial importations as well. Boston was the largest colonial shipping center, while New York City and Philadelphia ran second and third. Philadelphia, the most popular destination for European indentured servants, enjoyed a vibrant commercial and trading economy in Pennsylvania. Two major changes in British colonial policy became painfully evident to American colonists immediately following the French and Indian War. Number one, the first change involved the strict enforcement of existing regulatory acts. Number two, the second change involved the enactment of new legislation the purpose of which was to raise revenue from the colonies. 1769 to 1775, Boston was a powder keg of revolution waiting for a spark. By 1770, 1,000 British Army sentries were quartered in Boston, a population of about 15,000 people. After the Boston Tea Party, 3,000 troops remained. After the Seven Years' War across the colonies, 10,000 British Army regulars were left to police the colonies. As their intentions were unclear, the colonists resented this military presence during peacetime. Colonial merchants did not dispute Parliament's right to regulate the trade of the colonies. As men of commerce, they understood and even sympathized with the mercantile purpose of these acts. However, after 150 years of non-enforcement, it was difficult for colonial merchants and traders engaged in commerce to accept the new policies of strict enforcement and the validity of direct taxation. In the segment to follow, I would like to give you a background in history on the Sugar Act, Currency Act, and the Stamp Act, and also the colonial reactions that resulted. In April 1763, British warships were sent to America to enforce the Molasses Act, ready to expire. The act was reinstated by Parliament as the Sugar Act of 1764. Until strict enforcement of the Sugar Act was imposed, American merchants had been able to evade payment of duties for two reasons. Number one, West Indian British customs officials, where molasses was exported from, could be bribed 
to certify a shipload of molasses as British, when reality, it was mostly French. Secondly, American merchants were able to avoid at least a part of the duties due because of the lax nature of British customs officials at American ports. Most of these custom brokers were in the habit of taxing only a fraction of the cost to merchants, encouraging their profits. Bribes were frequent in American ports, too. Even for British sugar planters, this meant that they, too, not only the merchants, had been condoning the smuggling of molasses to the British colonies for processing into rum and evading paying the mandated duties. While colonists organized to block the passage of the Sugar Act, with the Molasses Act ready to expire, they pointed out that the duties reduced profits and would impact future ability by planters to produce the volume of ex sugar exported. After the Sugar Act passed, it reflected the power and effort to regulate colonial trade with vigor. Parliament gave the Navy the authority to stop any ocean-going vessel and inspect its cargo against the bill of lading. This is the manifest of cargo that was used to pay the export-import duties with. If discrepancies were found, the unlawfully transported cargo would be confiscated. In addition, criminal charges would be brought against the ship captain and the owner of the cargo. To make matters worse, one-third of the confiscated cargo went to the British colonial governor, encouraging his support, and one-third went to the crew of the confiscating ship. The last one-third went to the British government. This led to black market trading by colonists from the West Indies all the way to the fishing grounds off the coasts of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. With the Currency Act in 1764, colonial governments could no longer print their own paper money. They had to use the British pound. This effort, as mentioned before, wasn't all bad as an idea because it eliminated the risk of inflation. In the same year, to halt the smuggling of sugar and molasses produced in the West Indies, Parliament authorized the Navy to inspect all English vessels en route for smuggled goods. If found, goods were seized. But these two acts, while they outraged some colonists, did not create widespread calamity. It was with the Stamp Act that collectively outraged the politicians, the educated, and wealthy across the 13 colonies. In 1765, this law levied a tax on printed documents such as deeds, licenses, judgments, all transaction documents such as bill of lading, newspapers, and even playing cards. This outraged merchants, lawyers, politicians. It was seen and sometimes commented on by historians as a tax on knowledge. In addition, the colonists believed their rights had been violated because they did not give their consent to be taxed in the first place. They were still British subjects and Englishmen, right? This levy to tax official documents and printed materials caused three reactions. Number one, colonial town assemblies saw it as an attack on their political powers. John Adams wrote petitions for 22 Massachusetts town assemblies in protest to direct taxes. Across the colonies, about 5% of the population was articulate and educated. Another 20% was prone to violence, intimidation practices, and or public protest to voice consent. Keep in mind, British Canada and the British West Indies did not protest against direct taxes, no matter how much they did not like paying the imposed duties. Number two, collectively, 
mainland colonists pursued for and to Parliament nullification of the Stamp Act. From its inception, the duties were resisted across the colonies. Violence resulted by not so articulate groups. This would be the people, or known in history as the mob. Many customs duty officers were driven from their jobs and tarred and feathered. This led men of resistance, as a point number three, to form the Sons of Liberty. As merchants and politicians united against colonial taxes, the Virginia House of Burgesses had been one of the colonial legislative bodies to send a respectful message to Parliament stating their opposition to the stamp tax when it was proposed. It was one thing to declare opposition to a piece of proposed legislation and quite another to oppose an established law of the empire. Patrick Henry gave voice to Virginia's opposition of the stamp tax when he presented a series of resolutions to the House of Burgesses. Although not of P Patrick Henry's resolutions were adopted, the debates on them indicated a strong desire to resist the tax. Presentation of the Virginia Resolves by Patrick Henry marked the turning point in the colonial attitude. Moderation was rejected and radical opposition began to take its place. The Virginia Resolves were reprinted in newspapers across the colonies. Merchants from New York, Philadelphia, and Boston proposed a firm stand. They were concerned that the Stamp Act petition created by the delegates and due to present before Parliament would nullify the law. And this proposed a British blockade of imports to force Parliament to see the colonists were serious. Delegates against the stamps could not be issued by the start date if there were no stamp distributors. Thus colonists began in August to force the resignation of all stamp distributors. Virginians were the first in resisting the Stamp Act. Public effigies were burned in city squares, giving all an indication of what would happen to them if they tried to enforce the distribution of the stamps. While stamps arrived from England in September, by then most of the stamp officials had resigned from their jobs because of violent threats brought on by the colonists. Because no stamp distributors remained in office, customs officers declared that the stamped paper was unavailable and cleared ships without using stamped paper. In the meantime, in London, British merchants petitioned Parliament requesting repeal of the stamp tax. And this lobbying effort worked. British business interests viewed it like this. If the Stamp Act was going to hurt business relations with the American colonists, it had to be repealed. From the colonies, Ben Franklin advocated to Parliament to nullify the stamp tax. The stamp tax was repealed by 1766. The announcement early in 1766 of the repeal of the stamp tax was met with rejoicing and celebration in the colonies. One of the most important effects of the stamp tax crisis by the British American colonists was a considerable decline in respect for British authority. From 1769 through 1775, Boston became a powder cake of revolution. Violence broke out in 1769 between Bostonians and Redcoats, who were mainly there to ensure that customs duties were collected. But on March 5, 1770, a young apprentice incessantly taunted by a British sentry posted at the Boston Customs House. The sentry hit the boy with his weapon after the boy called him names 
and the crowd threw snowballs with oyster shells and rocks inside. The crowd grew larger, and the sentry was accused of abusing his authority. They shouted to kill the sentry. More snowballs and name-calling followed, then shots were sent into the Boston crowd, and five townspeople died. This event in American history is remembered as the Boston Massacre. Paul Revere incorrectly illustrated a scene quickly printed across the colonies in efforts to drive up the political drama. He authored the sensational drawing as pictured here. It suggested the British sentries organized and shot unarmed civilians in the streets of Boston. This was published in newspapers across the colonies. This illustration depicted an untrue sequence of events in which this mob aggravated the sentries. Shots were fired as the sentries feared the mob. John Adams risked his reputation by defending the British sentries at their trial. The colonial government was determined to give the soldiers a fair trial so there could be no grounds for retaliation from the British. The Boston jury was convinced by John Adams' defense and the sentries were not guilty, and rightly so. The jury believed their testimonies that the soldiers had felt threatened for their lives by this mob violence in the streets of Boston. As a historical backdrop, consider the following. By 1770, all customs duties were removed from the Townshead Acts of 1767, except for the one on tea. Somehow Parliament didn't think the colonists would notice or even care. From 1770 to 1773, the economy improved and conflict between the British and colonists cooled down. All the while, the newspapers, pamphleteers, and publishers of circulars in the colonies printed the political and social discourse. Newspapers were the medium by which politicians and colonists in general could voice their discontent. In many colonies, free speech and press was protected under their colonial constitutions. A group calling themselves the Sons of Liberty existed in almost every colony. Sons of Liberty units existed mostly in port towns across the colonies. Rich, poor, educated, and skilled laborers created their own groups based on similar views and activities, widely known for their violent and destructive acts. Actions included the burning of fake dummies of loyal tax officials in town squares, known as effigies, burning the crown officials' property while owners were held to watch. Young men as post-indentured servants as new members of colonial society are remembered as the most violent and uncontrollable. British authorities did not have sufficient social control, and in port towns like Boston and Philadelphia, these quasi-political groups dominated the political landscape in some towns. Londoners considered their acts as treasonous. On a cold winter night, December 16, 1773, an evening before tea was supposed to be unloaded at Portside, the Sons of Liberty that included about 150 Bostonians badly dressed as Mohawks made their way to Griffin's Wharf. Three ships were in the harbor, remembered as the Beaver, the Dartmouth, and the Eleanor, loaded with hundreds of crates of tea. The men boarded the ships and began destroying the tea. By 9 p.m. they opened 342 crates of tea from the three ships. Cargo valued at approximately 10,000 pounds sterling 
which is in today's money about 700,000 U.S. dollars. This destroyed private property as the tea was hurled into the harbor water. Interestingly, the Bostonian sons had taken off their shoes, swept the decks, and made each ship's first mate agree to say that the Sons of Liberty had destroyed the tea, thus taking credit for this act. This act of violence and destruction to private property brought criticism from both colonial and British officials. For instance, Benjamin Franklin stated that the destroyed tea must be repaid, and he offered to repay with his own money. King George III did not take this situation lightly. With the help of Parliament, the King closed Boston Harbor with the condition that it would remain closed until the colonists paid for the damaged cargo. This legislative reaction to the Boston Tea Party by British Parliament is remembered in history as the Intolerable Acts of 1774.